Welcome to the Life's Hard Succeed Anyway podcast, where you will hear transformational stories, positive encouragement, and practical strategies to help you grow your mindset, reach your potential, live your dreams, and experience a purpose-driven, impact-filled life. Here's your host, Alan Blaine. All right, this is Alan Blaine, and I am fired up to interview our special guest today, Eric McDougall. So let me tell you a little bit about Eric before we get going here. So Eric is not just a dedicated husband and father. He's a passionate relationship coach committed to helping high achieving men worldwide master the art of personal relationships. With over a decade of experience, Eric possesses a profound understanding of the key pillars of successful partnerships, effective communication, emotional intelligence, and creating enduring intimacy. So I look forward to hearing more about that here in a bit. Eric's approach is grounded in real life examples, proven strategies, and a touch of humor. His core purpose is to help successful men transform their relationships, fostering joy, passion, and a lasting legacy with their families. Love that, Eric. Welcome to the Life's Hard Succeed Anyway podcast. You ready for this? Absolutely, Alan. Thank you so much for having me and, and thanks for letting me come on and have this great conversation. Appreciate you taking the time to come on. And you know, I've given our li- listeners just a brief intro of who you are, Eric, but can you just take us back and kind of give us the high speed version of how you got to where you are today? And then maybe we can dive a little deeper into that. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, so yeah, I guess I can kind of start when I was young. So probably some of the big moments in my life. I grew up in a fairly big family. There was four of us. Um my parents split when I was quite young. So my dad and mom didn't make it work. So my dad actually left. And I think that kind of started a lot of my own challenges in life. You know, this idea of the father wound and and kind of what that has created in my life. So definitely was a big part of that. Um, Really did not have access to my dad when I was young. He was living in another city, which really led me to kind of blowing up at home, right? Didn't have a lot of masculine leadership. My mom was raising three other young kids. Uh, and it was a lot of challenge. I was rambunctious. I was angry. I was frustrated. Didn't really know how to deal with that. And so I think what that you know eventually led to was my dad kind of reaching out and thinking the best idea was to put me into foster care. Um, so I entered the system when I was about nine years old uh, and spent about five years kind of navigating the system. Some great placements that really totally transformed my life and, and brought a lot of lessons. And then some placements that were a little more challenging, right? At about 14, my dad uh, followed through on his commitment to kind of bring me to live with him. Um, And that kind of started my teen years. So living in a new city, being in a new home with him and his wife, my stepmom, who I deeply love, who's still part of my life, kind of, you know, continued to kind of be more of an individual, kind of figure myself out all the way till I was about 17 and uh, then kind of left on my own. Um, when, When I really look back at kind of a lot of that, I would say like core, uh, theme, if you will, in my life was that I spent a lot of time alone. So a lot of my time was spent kind of regulating, figuring myself out, being alone, being angry. And I carried that into my 20s. You know, this idea of pushing people away before they essentially let me down or get away from me was really a theme. And I think mm-hmm. through working, being career oriented, making a lot of money outside of school, um, you know, meeting Kate when we were very young, I was 18, she was 16. And uh, starting our relationship, a lot of it, those years were just spent overworking, over drinking, getting into drugs, kind of numbing a lot of this pain and anger that I experienced. And, you know, it, it kind of brought me into adulthood. I had pushed my family, my mom, my dad away, my siblings away. Um, and I was kind of left with this one person in my life, Kate, who was my everything, right? It was essentially my rock, who I had become very codependent on. And I was really starting to isolate myself. So, you know, we fast forward a couple more years. We had our first son, Francis, uh, which we're very blessed, totally healthy. And, you know, I remember being in the hospital room and I had experienced joy for only a moment. I remember having it. It was kind of, you know, typically around the birth, it's so crazy. The nurses are there, everything's happening. Wife's yelling, I'm freaking out. The adrenaline's rushing. My son is born, I hold him, and there's kind of this moment where time stops, and I just feel joy. Wow, this is so crazy. And then I remember immediately kind of falling into fear. 
and really just starting to replay this cycle of like, oh man, am I going to do to him what my dad did? And am I going to be able to change this? I'm going to screw him up and really kind of feeling this weight on me in terms of being a father. And I think that continued to lead to a lot of self-sabotage, right? To a lot of avoiding my role as a father, avoiding my role as a husband, working more, making more money, driving up the food chain, you know, in the restaurant and hotel industry, continuing to drink, continuing with my addiction issues. And then, you know, to a point where Kate was essentially living kind of as a single mom, right? Five, six nights a week, she was having dinner alone with my son. She was traveling on her own. I wasn't really around. And then, you know, as <laughs> most people who are really struggling think might be a good idea to do, we decided, hey, you know, it might be a good idea to have another kid. That'll save us, right? Yeah. That'll all work out. So we had our daughter. And I remember kind of fast forwarding, you know, essentially continuing Kate being a single mom of two, me continuing to work. And again, outside, people are looking at us and it's like, Eric, you have the life, you have a beautiful wife, two kids, you have the job, you're making a lot of money. And inside, you know, I'm sure you've probably heard the story before, but there was this kind of emptiness, right? Yeah. And I, I love the quote, you know, I'll never forget. I think it was a rock star that said it. It's this idea of like, I've been to the top, there ain't nothing up there. And how like, I essentially, you essentially spend your whole life trying to get to the top and then slowly realizing like, oh, you're just chasing nothing, right? Not, nothing could fill right. the void that you essentially have to heal yourself. And I remember, you know, Kate and I were married, two kids. Uh, my daughter at this point was about two. My son Francis was five. And things were really starting to implode. You know, we had people in our life saying, you know, my, my family, my siblings saying like, Kate, got to get away from Eric. You know, he's got alcoholism. He's struggling. He's never there. He's emotionally abusive. So everybody in my life was telling us, you know, hey, you need to divorce. Essentially, that's what would be healthy. How long ago is this? Approximately what age frame? And maybe just back up just a second. Like what age you were 18 and 16 when you met, married and had a child at what age? And now what age are we in this part of the story? Yeah, thanks for asking. So, uh, Kate and I, so we had our son when I was 29. So, Francis was born when I was 29. Uh, we had my daughter, Elodie, uh, when I was 32. And, uh, and this about five years ago, so I'm 39 now, uh, about five okay. years ago was kind of where everything came to a head. Now, for us, I, it wasn't really a surprise. Like, things have been really struggling for a while, but I'll be honest, Alan, like, this whole idea of getting a divorce was like one of my biggest fears. Because it, it was really just affirming, you know, that I was essentially my father. Like I was turning into my right. father. My marriage was ending. I, I couldn't stop the cycle, et cetera. And I remember, you know, I'll never forget, I had started my sobriety journey. I was about two months sober at the time. I said, you know, I, I got to do something. I got to change something. I'd reached out to a, a good friend of mine now, Larry Hagner from the Dad Edge, and said, dude, I need some help. You know, whatever you're doing, I want to be part of it. My life's imploding, and whatever happens at this point, I just got to kind of save myself. And I, rem I remember, Alan, you know, I, I kind of talk about this in my story, but there was a moment when we were in the kitchen, things were coming to a head. Kate was debating leaving me. We were talking about ending our marriage. And we were in the kitchen having a conflict. And my kids were sitting there on the kind of dining nook. And we're arguing and we're yelling, and Kate got really close to me. And I essentially put my arms up and I pushed her. And I remember it was like everything stopped. You know, Kate was kind of back on the ground. She was holding up against, against the railing upstairs in our home. I kind of stopped. And I remember telling her, you know, Kate, like at this point, it's up to you. Like, I don't know what's going to happen next. I've never been down this hole this far. I've never pushed somebody like this. And so if you want to get away, right, I encourage you take the kids, get away, and I'll kind of figure myself out. And I think for, you know, for us, what we, th we think about that moment now, we talk about it on a podcast, like it was the start of the solution, right? It was really me looking at myself and saying, Eric, no matter what happens, whether your marriage survives or not, whether your kids love you or not, whether anything happens for them, you have to be better and you have to learn to love yourself and love them and serve them. If that means you're going to serve your kids half the time. If that means you're going to learn to love your wife from a distance, that's okay. But at this point, it's kind of about healing and I mean, a lot of people know our story. Obviously, we have a very happy ending. I have a very strong, powerful wife. You know, really, really honored to do partnership with her. We decided to stay. You know, we kind of laughed, but it's, she was really the only person that I couldn't push away. She just wasn't going to give up on me. And I think at a time when I really, 
was starting to give up on myself. You know, she fought for me and she fought for us. And I think that really helped us wow. come back from it. So now, you know, I, I help men in their relationships. I understand the importance of them. I understand how long I ignored my own at the cost of chasing success. And I firmly believe that, you know, the quality of your relationships dictate the quality of your lives. And so your relationship with your partner, with your kids, you know, I think are extremely important. And I think as really successful, high achieving men, it's not always skills that we're taught. 100% agree. And so now, Eric, thank you for sharing that. You said you have a podcast. Tell us about the podcast real quick. What is that all about? Yeah. So Kate and I do a podcast called the Evolve Marriage Podcast. Uh, it's something that we host together. Um, we started the podcast, I guess almost two and a half years ago now, uh, just kind of the, as a pet project, right? I remember literally saying like, hey, would it be crazy if we started a podcast and we had these guests on and, and Kate, my wife was like, are you crazy? Like those people are never going to want to talk to us. Like they're never, you know, totally sabotaging ourselves, all these limiting beliefs. Right. And it just kind of started to pick up steam. You know, I think people really related to us. Uh, Kate's very funny. She's very down to earth. I add some very specific actionable skills. And so I think over time, our podcast has grown. We've had some really amazing guests. Uh, we love talking and, and hearing from couples who have overcome adversity in their own lives. Um, and I think we really created it because we really wanted to give individuals and couples some actionable skills that they could implement. You know, I think a lot of times uh, we hear the story, we hear the aspirational, hey, here's where we are. But we don't necessarily hear about, hey, this is what we do when we really screw up. And here's how I screwed up last week yep. and how we overcame it. And so we really wanted to create something that was helping people take action in their relationships. I love it. So is the podcast audience more for men? It's not just for men then, it's for men and women, I guess. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So we speak to couples, to individuals in relationship. Um, I think because of the nature of work that I do, I coach men. A lot of men gravitate to it. But uh, kind of a funny thing is most of our audience are female listeners. I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah. I think men in relationships can be, you know, a complex topic to enter and men listening to the podcast about marriage, maybe something they do a little more in secret. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and I could see if it's got great content, which I'm sure it is, you know, plenty of wives hearing good stuff that you're sharing and forwarding episodes to their husband to, <laughs> to get to listen to. And then you also run a mastermind coaching and mastermind business. Is that correct? Correct me if I'm wrong on that. That's right. Yeah. So I kind of my, the main thing that I do is I run a group for men. So it's kind of our mastermind. Um, it's a blend. So there's group coaching. They get one-on-one -on -one access to me. There's courses. You know, I kind of continue to, to teach skills in that. And what I really wanted, you know, when I created this, it was really to bring men who were really successful, who were emotionally intelligent, who kind of had all life figured out, but their relationship was just disconnected. You know, I think in, in all long-term relationships, when we prioritize the business of marriage, taking care of our families, creating a lot of security, um, it's natural to kind of lose the spark. And so I think, you know, what we wanted to do with the mastermind was not only create a space where men could open up and talk about this, right? Topics from, you know, our emotions and how we're feeling and our insecurities and our father wounds all the way to talking about sex and what we love and what we enjoy mm -hmm. and how do we bring more pleasure mm -hmm. to our partner. And uh, creating a, a safe space of like mature men who are high achieving has really made that mastermind thrive. I like to say, you know, a lot of guys join for me and my coaching, but they typically stay for the community. Yep, I could see that. What, how long have you been doing that now? Yeah, so officially in, in this iteration of the mastermind, we're doing it for about two, two and a half years. Um, so a lot of members started with me two and a half years ago, still doing life with me. I'm going to the UK soon in May to meet a lot of them. Uh, so yeah, it's been, a, it's been a fun ride. I love it. When you think like back to the way you grew up with your parents splitting at a young age and just the, the broken home and, and like you said, the father wounds that you carried into adulthood. I mean, I can relate, relate with that so, so much. I know so many of our listeners can. I think, I think someone was just sharing with me the other day. I think it's eight, over 80% of people will be divorced at some point in their lifetime. Thankful it doesn't have to be that way, but that is the statistics is what at least someone shared with me. But in, in any case, it's, it's high, right? It's the majority of, of people, children that do will grow up with a broken home. So I didn't, I didn't grow up in a broken home. It happened after I was an adult. But what do you think is more common in your experience with working with other men? Let me ask this. Because I could see it going one of two ways. I could see it going, hey, I don't want to be anything like that. And it's going to be fuel to fuel me to not 
leave my wife, to not abandon my children, to not do the wrong thing, whatever that case may be, to save my marriage, to, uh, whatever I need to do. Or it can be kind of like those thoughts you were having, which I think would be totally natural to question, am I going to just be like him? Am I going to just duplicate that? Because you said that was a big thing for you, right? That fear of, I'm just going to be like my dad. I'm going down this path. Like, yeah. what would you say to somebody? I guess it's a kind of a two-part question, I guess, because I'm not really even sure of what my question is. One is, do you think different people are, that it's fueled positively or negatively for different people? And if so, and if so, what can people do to use it as positive fuel and energy instead of more of a victim, like an excuse to kind of just go along with that, you know, lineage? History. Absolutely. No, and, and I love the question and I, I kind of want to unpack it because I think it's a big question that could really serve the audience and the listeners. So one of the things I think about is, you know, for me personally, um, my story began with, I don't want to be like my dad, right? That was a story. Now okay. I work with men where like you're talking about, it's kind of the opposite, but in the end, it, in a, some way when they're struggling, it, it's also, I'll never live up to my dad, right? True. And so in a sense, when you, when you think about kind of how they're approaching this, and I'm not talking about like healthy men who, who just are kicking ass and feel really confident. I mean, we all have that shadow inside of us, right? That's what I'm talking about. That shadow, maybe when we're in that darkness and we're questioning or judging ourselves, especially when we're young, typically the story you tell yourself around this example of a man you have is like what you're saying. And it's, I don't want to be nothing like him. So I'm going to do everything I can to do the opposite, Right. And in that case, it's almost like a, a push, like you're pushing away from that. You're trying to get away from it. So whatever you do is I'm going to do different things than him. And so in the case with my marriage ending, you know, I was like, no, like we're staying together. I don't even care if this marriage is abusive or crazy or I'm crazy. I am not getting a divorce, right? Because my biggest fear was probably my biggest fear was not necessarily being like my dad, but probably even more than that was having my son experienced what I experienced would probably be more right. accurate to say. But on the other side is true where it's, you know, oh, I want to be like that, but I'll never measure up to it. So why even bother? Right. And that's kind of the other side of the father wound. One of the things that I tell all men in this situation, Alan, is you really have to come to terms that that's not your story. Like you are essentially creating a story on the platform of your father. And I, I think that's really hard for some men because we don't have a lot of great examples of men in our lives, right? The guys that I work with, typically they have a father, it's a father wound there, you know, the, the, the confusion of what's been happening to men over the last 20 years with the fe feminist movement and all that stuff. I mean, being a man has completely changed. Right. But so we don't necessarily know how to essentially choose who we want to be and write our own story. And so what I see with a lot of men, high achieving men, especially me, this idea that I had checked all the boxes that I was told to check, right? And I'm sure, Alan, you might have had something to say. A lot of your listeners, hey, if you get a job, go to college, get a wife, get a kids, get a dog, get a house, it's made, then equals happiness, right? right. It's like a blueprint. We're or all wrong. sold. Yeah, sure. And so the idea becomes is when I've done all that, that's kind of how I was feeling, right? I've done all that. I have the wife, I have the kids, I have the money, I have the job, and I don't have happiness, Right? Then at that moment is like the catalyst for your breakthrough, which is, oh, I can create whatever I want at this point. Now, in that moment, some people go out seeking and they continue to live life according to, again, sometimes their fathers. So, well, what will my dad do? Well, I got to be different than my dad and I got to be, you know, completely transformational or I got to be more like my dad because he had success and he looked happy and I got to be more like him. But I think the real transformational moment and it came for me was when I decided this is my life. And the scariest thing I could do is decide how to live it for myself, right? Because that made the stakes that much higher. I couldn't blame my dad anymore. You know, the, the, for a long time, my story was I'm a child of divorce who was in the system, who was an alcoholic. Like, no wonder my life screwed up. But then mm -hmm. to really change that story and say, I'm going to make my own story. I can create whatever life I want really empowered me. And it was no longer necessarily related to, oh, it's because of my dad or I have to be different than my dad. Hmm. And I think for me, that completely shifted. So one of the big things that I tell a lot of men, you know, regardless is it's great to aspire to be like amazing men. It's great to, to kind of take that. But in the end, you're going to come at a point in your life where you're going to have to look yourself in the mirror and say, it's up to you to write the rest of the story. And I think for a lot of men, I think people in general, that's, that's incredibly challenging, right? It's scary to know that 
well, now that I take ownership of this life, when I disappoint somebody, it's because of the choices I made. If my marriage ends, it's because of the choices I made. If I don't see my kids or my kids don't like me, it's because of the choices I made. And I think that amount of, I don't know, like looking yourself in the mirror and kind of owning up to that can be really scary and challenging for a lot of men. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Yeah, I do think, I think it's a great answer to my question. What, what would you, I mean, you've had a ton of success um, and, you know, I'm sure uh, even a lot more success in the things that matter most since getting sober five years ago. But what would you say is one of the keys to your success, Eric? Oh, that's a great question. I think, you know, probably a big part of what leads me to success is that I always go by Simon Sinek's work around the infinite game. Right. This idea of, so we talk about it in the group of like mastery, right? We're working towards mastery. And so mastery is just, you are always a student. You are always learning, right? And even at the end of our life, we will be unfinished men, right? All you can do every day is continue to grow, continue to learn. And, and I do think that my, and I think this was, you know, when I look back on my life, I think it was learned through not having a dad around being in the foster system was this idea of the resilience that I have of like, I'm just going to take the risk, right? I'm going to step into that. Yeah, it's scary, but I'm going to choose courage. I'm going to step into that knowing that there's something to learn. And I I think a lot about this idea that as long as I continue to be open to learning, as long as I choose to put myself in a role as a student, I think I can continue to show up better than I did yesterday. And I'm very honest. I think that's why a lot of the guys in the group, you know, gravitate to me is I'm in the group doing life side by side by them, right? Alan, Right. Even before we started this conversation, you were teaching me stuff. And I'm like, great, right? But I do think that if people close themselves off to being a student of life and to their ability to learn, I think there's so much potential that they're kind of not tapping into. So good. I, I agree. I've, I've just committed and, and I'm excited about being a lifelong learner right alongside you, Eric, because yes. there's so much to learn. And at 50, almost two years old, I just, I mean, every year that passes, I learn more and more. And the more I learn, the real, more I realize I have to learn. And like you said, I, they'll, I'm sure when I'm, you know, 120, if God allows me to live that long, that's my goal. I'll even more realize how little I know. And so it's just an exciting way to live as what's the alternative to think we know it all, stop learning, stop asking questions, stop being curious and just start dying. I mean, cause that's not an alternative I really embrace. So I love hearing what you shared. That was I appreciate awesome. that. Alan. And I, I want to touch base just on the last thing you said, which is so important because I think all of us do that, right? We look at, you know, I work with guys who have teenage kids. My son's nine right now. He kind of knows everything already. But I, I do yeah. think about how that's not a new thing. Right. Where like when I was 17, I thought I knew it all. And then when I was 30, I was like, remember when I was 17, I thought I knew it all. And just like you're saying, I'm sure I'll be 50 and be like, remember when I was 39 and I thought I had all the answers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that that's just life, right? You continue to learn as you go through one door, there's a bigger room with 10 other doors. And I think that's the yeah. beauty of it. It is. And a big key to success. That's why I loved your answer because we both met those guys or gals. Uh, it's usually guys that seem to know it all. They literally think they know it all at 39 or 59 or whatever, age, or 19 or whatever age they are, right? And it's like, oh, life's going to be hard for you, man. Life's going to be hard for you if you're not yeah. willing to learn and grow. Well, I got asked, by the way, how did you get sober? I mean, you said you're five years sober. What, tell us that story. What was what was the key there? I'm, plenty yeah. of listeners that would love to know that and could use the help. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, my, my sobriety journey, um, I mean, a little bit different than most people. I, I didn't do any programs. So I was in the service industry for a long time. I used to create beverage programs. That was kind of my thing. So I'd go into really popular restaurants or world-renowned restaurants, and I'd create a beverage program for them. And, and I realized that I, this was really like my coping mechanism. You know, oftentimes, Kate would go to bed, and, and I would stay up for hours, just drink. And when you're a beverage director, people just bring you alcohol. It's kind of the thing, right? Here, try this, try this, try this. And I realized one day, you know, for a long time, I had talked about getting sober, you know, and I think this is how a lot of people start. They realize it's a challenge, but then they start imagining their life without this thing. You know, and I started thinking about like, how am I going to do my job? What's going to happen to my kid's wedding? Like, am I really not going to drink forever? So you create all these barriers and, and you essentially justify why you continue to drink. Right. And I remember one day, you know, things kind of shifted. Five years sober, actually January 17th. Um, I sat down on January 17th. Thanks. And, and I realized I needed to speak this out in the world to make the change. So I had to stop 
like telling me, it was really just Kate and I that I wanted to get sober. Oh, I'm going to get sober. And after watch, like, yeah, right. So what I did is I created an email. I put all my family, all my in-laws. So I had a lot of siblings, my parents and all my in-laws. And I put them in an email and I made a commitment to them. I like it. I said, Hey, just so you know, I'm not at a place where I can make a commitment to myself. I don't really love myself that much or care about myself, but I care about all you. And I want to know that on this day, January 17th, it's my first day sober. And I'm going to go as long as I can. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been over four years. It's been a total transformational journey. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it, I mean, I, I want to say I did it on my own, but I didn't really do it on my own. I mean, I had so much support, family and friends and my wife. Um, but it would probably be more accurate to say I didn't go through a program, yeah. which I know have been helpful for a lot of people. You know, AA and NA has been helpful for a lot of people. But I love what you did there. I mean, it's, it's accountability is what you did, right? You put it out there to the ones that you know and love and care about the most and you know care about you the most. And you made a statement, a bold statement, and you've obviously followed through on it. So kudos to you. Congratulations. And isn't life better? Oh, so much. Yeah. And it's so funny because I was going to say, like, I think, you know, I had all these fears around my friendships changing and stuff like that. And my connections, they've actually gotten better. You know, it actually encouraged my friends to go hiking and have coffee instead of going for a beer. And, you know, typically when I get together, my family and friends now we're active and we're, and so I do think that as much as it, it was scary and I had this thought that I would be ostracized, it actually brought a totally new enlivening energy to the group, which was I think really reaffirming in terms of my choice. I love it. I hope that's super encouraging to anybody listening that would have those exact same thoughts, you know, that you had like all the excuses, basically that there, that there is life on the other side of alcohol and it's a sweet, sweet life, much sweeter. During that time though, was there, I mean, going through all the struggle, was there the negative thoughts in your head, the negative voices? And like, what did you do to kind of deal with those thoughts? in the midst of going through all that, whether it was the alcohol, whether it was the marriage, just, and I'm sure they were all intertwined too, because it was all in that same season. It sounds like, how do you deal with all those thoughts in your head that we all get at different t- points in time when we're going through the struggle? Yeah. I, I really appreciate you asking that. Um, I mean, I think the short answer, and I kind of, kind of elaborate here, but I, I think that the scariest thing for me and probably for a lot of men out there actually that i that I connect with was that I couldn't do it alone. Like I needed help. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it came to the point where I was, I was a lone wolf for so long and I was so good at pushing people away before they betrayed me or left me in the same way that my dad did all that crap. But, but I think really committing to myself that I would reach out to people whenever I found myself struggling. And so I remember, especially in the beginning, you know, I had created relationships again, just like, you know, we both know Larry, Larry was instrumental in my transformation I had great friends. I had met a lot of great men in my life, mentors, you know, who served as father figures for me. And I told them pretty upfront saying like, Hey man, are you cool? If you know, when I'm struggling or I'm kind of my head, if I just call you, leave a message or send a voice memo and they're like hundred percent. And so I remember, you know, and, and there's this beautiful quote that I'll never forget. I want to get this quote tattooed. It's so amazing. There's this line that really helped me get through it all, which is never worry alone. And I think that can be so hard, right? When you're in the shadow, when you're in a funk, mm. when you're living in your head, it's like a, it's like a cyclone and it just kind of eats you up. And I think that's why we talk about in the group, this idea of speaking it out, right? In the same way that I started my sobriety by speaking out my, my challenge. Well, that's what I did as I was healing and overcoming and kind of growing myself was sometimes it was literally just, I'd pick up the phone and I would just send a voice memo. Hey, this was going on for me. This was happening. I'm in my head. And over time, when I realized Alan, and again, you know, this is for anybody who, is debating getting help. Like, please just reach out, reach out to somebody you trust, reach out to me if you want, right? Reach out to Alan, like just send, send an email. Sometimes just writing it or speaking it out is in itself the healing thing. So I remember, you know, there was times, and I'll never forget this, where I would start a voice memo and I'd send it to my mentor and I'd talk. And then halfway through the voice memo, I would just coach myself out of it. I'm like, oh, I, I know what to do. Like, God, I'm so sorry. Anyways, I'll talk to you later. I'll get back to you when I've done the thing I said that I would do. Isn't <laughs> right? that interesting? Just verbalizing the question or verbalizing the concern, verbalizing the fear, the worry, uh, whatever. Sometimes we can hear our own voice and go, oh, yeah, I know how to correct this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I know what I need to be doing. But that's awesome. So accountability is was the huge factor, essentially, is what I'm hearing, having, having um, community 
community and accountability, would you say? A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a risk for all of us, right? Like, I think for me in the beginning, it was like, can I trust these people? You know, in the beginning it was like, oh, can I really count on this guy? But in the end, I had to choose to risk that. I had to be open and say, hey, Eric, you got to get uncomfortable here. You got to connect yeah. with people. And then because of that, I was rewarded, which I think is really powerful. You know, just we all have the temptation to believe that we're the only ones in this particular, dealing with this particular thing in our marriage, in our health, in our, with alcohol, whatever the, whatever the struggle is. And you start opening up to a few, you know, one or more people and you start realizing really quick, man, it's not unique to me. You know, these are challenges other people face. And that in itself is, is just kind of encouraging or really encouraging, you know? I was going to say too, Alan, just like the last little note here to, to encourage people. And again, like you have to be responsible for your message, right? It's important not to just kind of puke your suffering onto everybody constantly because that in itself is having an effect on your nervous system, just continuing True. to replay that stuff. But, but I do want to say that, you know, as humans, we connect through suffering, right? How many, I mean, for me, you know, if we got on here and we were just talking about how much money we make and how success, it's like, okay, that's great. But like, then you start opening up like, oh, I've been through this in my marriage and that, oh, that's connecting, right? That's human. Yeah. And so yeah. really important to understand, like we connect through our suffering. And if you can share your story in a way that is connecting, well, then people typically gravitate closer to you. I think it's important. Very good point. And something that we talk a lot about in our business, just because connection is everything. And in just what you said, I mean, the way we connect the best with people is, is to talk on a, a level deeper than that surface level. You know, you can only connect so deep talking about who's going to win the Super Bowl or whatever, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, like you said, if you're, if it's only highlights, I mean, we connect with the, with the hero in every movie and every book and every story because of the struggle. It's not because they won the victory. Now we'll celebrate the victory, but we're really celebrating the victory because of the struggle that Braveheart went through or Rocky went through or name the, name the character. Right. So I love, I love that. Often I think we forget about that. What advice would you give to others, Eric, that may be going through a similar struggle as you? Maybe something altogether different. We haven't talked about finances. Maybe they're going through a financial struggle. Maybe they're going through who knows what. What, what advice would you give to them right now in the midst of their storm? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think when I, for me, I'm all about, you know, taking action and actionable things. You know, if I go back to my story when I was really struggling, I really had to start to think about, you know, number one, what is like the desired end state? Right? You call it like start with the end in mind, like all that stuff. Right. And for some of us, it can be challenging, right? If you're really in panic mode, it can be really hard for your brain to come up with a future vision, right? And so what I often say is whatever desired end state you can think about, that's what you want to imagine. For some of us who are in a really healthy place, you can imagine like five years in the future, you can envision that, right? That's what you want to do. But maybe you just got dropped a bomb and, and your partner, and, hey, I want to get a separation. Maybe something happened with your kids. Like, Maybe you're in a panic mode. And so maybe your desired end state is, hey, I want to create this tomorrow or I want to create this next week, right? So I always think about that in terms of what is it you want to do? Like, where do you want to go? And then you step back and you think about what's the first step I can take to move towards that, right? One of the things we talk a lot about in the mastermind is momentum. And, you know, you can translate the business, right? How many people say, oh, I want to make a million dollars, but they don't know how to make $10. Right. And so it's like, hey, that's great that you want to make a million dollars. Put that on the shelf. Like, think about that, aspire to it. But let's right now just focus on making $10. Right. And let's kind of just understand the act of doing that work and taking that step. And then when we take that step, we're going to realize, oh, we learned a bunch of stuff. Cool. Now we can continue to mold it. And so that's typically, you know, we talk about this idea of the right next step. But when you think about it, you know, think about your future, what you want, and then dial it back and say, what's the right next step? Right. Maybe if you want to heal something, it's you need to have a conversation to repair and apologize. Maybe if you want to reconnect with someone you haven't reconnected in a long time, it's not, I need to figure out what to talk about. It's actually just pick up the phone and dial the number. Right. And then see where it goes. So many of us are, are kind of being led by, oh, but then what if this happens? And I got to create alternate visions for all that stuff. But it's like when you're in a, in a mode where you're really trying to create change, sometimes the best thing to do is implementation so you can learn and decide what step to take next. That's some super good advice, Eric. And I love how you, like, as you said, you gravitate towards actionable steps. 
I mean, I'm all about that. It's one thing to talk theory and I love talking vision. And I think, and you hit on it, we all need to have one. Mm-hmm. So when we get punched in the face, we, we, we at least can keep our eye on the prize. We know where we're going when we get spun around. We know where, where, the, where the target is. Yes. But I love how you said too, I mean, the, the five-year vision, the, the 50-year vision, maybe that's not the time to worry about it when you just got punched in the face. It's like, what's the next step I need to be taking towards that vision and take that step? That was so good. So good. If you could go back in time, Eric, what, and, and I mean, I, I love asking this question and, and I dislike asking it too, but I like it enough to ask it to every guest because I know there's so, I know at 52 years old almost, I, I, there's so many things I'd love to tell my younger self, like a lifetime of stuff. But if you could just pick one thing, what would be one of the things you'd love to tell your younger self? Yeah. It, I, what just came to me, you know, and I, I think just telling myself like the reassurance that I'll be okay. You know, I I often think about this, like a lot of people come to me in their panic mode. I was in panic mode. And to have somebody in your life really like sit with you, you know, and say like, you're going to be okay. It's not always going to be like this. And like, yes, things are not okay now, but they will be okay. I think there was times that if I had that in my life, I probably would have been able to pick myself up off the mat, you know, or kind of shake off that punch that much quicker. I often think about that, you know, even now in the coaching that I do, sometimes it's just, you know, when a man's experiencing pain, and I see a lot of guys do this, right? It's like somebody's coming to you, experience pain, and the first thing we do is give them advice, right? We're like, oh, here's some advice. Here's what you should do. And one of the things I often say about advice, because we don't give advice in the mastermind, I train guys not to give advice, share your story, share what works for you, and allow people to pick up what they want. But one thing about advice is when you need it, typically you're not in a position to use it. Right. So if you're like, like you're talking about the punching analogy, if you get punched in the mouth and I'm like, okay, so next time you get punched, you know, you want to dodge and just like, I just got punched. It's too late. Right. Right. And then later on, when things are good, you don't really need the advice. Right. Cause you're like, things are good. I don't want to change anything. And so for me, when I think about this idea of like giving advice in the moment, probably what I would need most when I'm struggling is, Hey, like I see you, I witness you. Yep. You're experiencing pain. It's real. It's part of the human experience and you'll be okay. Yeah. And I think that alone, even now, right, when I'm when I'm facing big decisions, I think a lot of it is just trusting myself to say, like, Eric, just take a breath, relax, you're gonna respond, and things will work out as long as you make choices from your values and from your integrity. Right. Yeah. I think that's great, Eric. That's great advice. Um, we can all apply that. And you know, anyone that's lived any length of time can think back to a time when it felt like this is the most big, you know, the most massive thing. It's just catastrophic. And, and yeah, it might've been a big catastrophic thing, a loss of a loved one, a loss of a relationship, a loss of a job. I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, I know we've been through um, and you have as well. It's like that they are catastrophic, but you know, I think, I think all the time, like 10 years from now, is this really going to be catastrophic to me? You know, (laughs) to along that same line, probably not. You know, and it just kind of puts things, helps me put things in perspective in the moment. This has been awesome. Just some kind of rapid fire, kind of 30 second quick questions for you here. Love to ask all my guests, but do you have like a favorite success quote that you'd be willing to share? Oh, wow. That's good. I have a couple. I, I guess for me, my big one is like Robert Frost's, right? The only way around is through. Yeah. I, I think about that one a lot when I'm like struggling. You know, I think about Phil Stutz and, and it kind of his three rules where he talks like there'll always be pain, there'll always be uncertainty. And there's always going to be more work to do. And for me, that quote embodies so much where it's like, when I spent my life avoiding hard things, things got harder. But when I decided to face those hard things and decided to kind of move through them, um, you know, beyond that, it's just everything, right? Possibility, creation, like whatever you want to call it. So that's one of them. And since I'm all about relationships, you know, one of the things that I always come back to when people are struggling in their marriages and all oh, things are changing and I wish it could go back to the way it used to be. I always think about Esther Perel's quote, which is um, most people are going to have three or four committed adult relationships in their life. And it's up to us to decide if we want to do it with the same person. And I think a lot about that, you know, you've been married 31 years, Alan, Kate and I've been together 20 years. Like we're totally different people than we were. And so right. much of our relationship is evolving, getting to know each other all over again, right? Learning to be in this new season in our relationship. And that quote just embodies so much because I think so many people are tied to the past instead of facing what's in front of them and focusing on what they want to create. So that's always been a good one for me. 
That's a good one. That's very good. What is one habit that's helped you in your success, Eric? Oh yeah. So I'll give you an actual one. So gratitude, right? I could say gratitude. Gratitude has changed my life. And I actually want to give you uh, kind of, so I do gratitude in four steps every single morning. I do this. Let's hear it. Yeah. So first I take a journal. I write three things, something I'm grateful for about myself, right? That was one of the hardest one for a while, right? Maybe it was my work ethic, my strength, my ability to ask questions, whatever. The next one was another person. Maybe it was Kate, my kids, you know, today it might be you, Alan, like, you know, all these things, even just being grateful that we're having this conversation. The third one is something that I take for granted in my life, right? This is like, we all it could literally be my ability to walk. I think about running water in my home, right? So these are things that we just think, oh, it just is what it is. But yeah, some people don't have running water in their lives, right? And so those are the three things that I write down every day. And then one of the most powerful things that I think a lot of people say they're going to do, but they don't do, I send a message of gratitude to somebody in my life every single day. And so I share specifically, you know, why I'm reaching out, share gratitude. I talk about a moment that's happened or a moment that I just remembered. And I explain why I'm so grateful and how it makes me feel. And I've been doing that for yeah, a while now. And, and sometimes I don't even get a response, right? But sometimes it starts a conversation, people share love, and it's created so much connection in my life. So good, Eric. I love that. So something you're grateful for about yourself, you're someone else. Someone else, yeah, another person. And something you take for granted, like breathing, walking, exactly. running water. Yeah. yeah. And then sending a, a message to somebody of gratitude every day. Yeah. And the last one is really important, right? And not to go too long on this, but it's actually been proven that we can change the way people feel by sharing a story, right? Because as humans, we share information through story. By sharing a story about a specific moment that makes you grateful for that person, you can actually brighten their day and change their brain. And so it's really important, right? If you start doing this to your partner every day or do this to somebody you love, you can actually change your experience of life. And so I, that old quote, like, oh, you can't change somebody. It's like, uh, yeah, I get what you're trying to say, but actually you have a massive ability to influence others. So good. I love that so much. It was, I think, just two weeks ago. We have a weekly activity challenge for our team members every single week, and it rotates. But two weeks ago, the challenge was to send an average of three a day, 20 for the week, actually, 20 messages like you just described to 20 different people. And uh, it was fun because a lot of people had never done that before and getting the feedback and the experiences and, you know, on both sides, what it does for them to give, the Bible says it's better to give than receive. Mm -hmm. And what it does for, as you said, for the receiver to receive that, I mean, it's a win-win. So I love that you said you shared that, Eric. Oh, you're welcome, dude. What is one book that you'd recommend for the Life's Hard Succeed Anyway audience? Wow, that's a good one. So, uh probably one that has been top of mind. So I, this year, I'm actually reading 52 books minimum. That's kind of my commitment, right? The year of learning. Nice. So I'm reading a book a week. I recently reread, it's probably the third time I read it, but uh, The Gap and the Gain is by Dan Sullivan, yeah. Ben Hardy. Yeah. So if you're like have a challenge with mindset or, or you have perfectionist ideas or you always think, oh, I'm never winning, whatever, read this book. It's such a powerful, simple shift to, to go from gap mindset to gain mindset and not really losing the vision, you know, that what you want to aspire to. So it's such a powerful book. I, I've been recommending it to a lot of people. Um, people who kind of struggle and are looking at life and, you know, glass half full kind of approach. Right. Um, it's a really great book to just check out. It's a quick read and it's so powerful and actionable. Yeah, so good. So good. And um, especially for the high achievers that you're, that especially for the higher achievers, it's everybody, but it's especially the high achievers that are always measuring, you know, hey, I'm, I'm not quite there yet. I'm not quite there yet never going to be there. You know, get out of the gap. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. So it's such a good book. Um, what, what is your definition of success? Eric, do you ever think about that? Yeah, I, I do. And so for me, I always go back to this idea of being a servant leader, right? We talk a lot about that in the work that I do, but this idea of not only being a leader, but actually being a servant leader. And one of the things, you know, I've kind of transformed it even more now, which I, I tell men is I aspire to be a servant leader for others without losing or sacrificing myself, right? And to me, that's very important because for a long time, I've seen men just give, 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 and they kind of lose themselves, right? They sacrifice their values. They sacrifice their morals. They don't know how to say no. They don't have any boundaries. And so I really do think about, you know, how can I be a servant leader? How can I serve the most people in the world without losing the core of who I am, right? And so for me, that's my idea of success, right? 
being a servant leader without losing or sacrificing who I am at my core. Yeah, interesting. I like that. What excites you about the future when you think about the future right now? Maybe something you're working on, maybe just something in general that you're excited about. Yeah, I'm, I mean, there's so many things. I, I think for me personally, I'm very excited to build relationships. You know, I think it's been, it's been so exciting for me to even, you know, these, these type of connections, connecting with you, Alan. Um, I love connecting and meeting with people who are trying to make an impact on the world, whether it's their families, their communities, the world. So I'm really excited about that. I think on a grand, grander scale, I'm actually excited for, I don't want to say, but almost like this awakening that men have had, right? When I think about relationships for a long time and what's out there in public, for a long time, it was this idea that, you know, if women are winning, men lose. And if men are winning, win women lose. And personally, that's not how I view it. Right. And I think there's been this whole movement of men to be like, hey, we can have our side alongside powerful, amazing women. And we ourselves can also be powerful, not in a way that takes away from anyone, but in a way where we're all playing at our strengths, right? And we're all playing full out in the most loving way possible. Yeah. And I've been noticing, you know, a lot more men are starting to see that, um, which I think is really, really important and really excites me. Love it. What is the best way for our listeners to follow along on your journey, Eric, and uh, connect with you if they choose to do that? Thanks, Alan. Yeah. So probably the easiest way is just to go to evolvemarriage.com. It's our website. Um, our podcast is there, information about the mastermind. Um, I'm active mostly on Facebook. To be honest, I should, shouldn't say I'm active. My team's active on Facebook. I try to stay off social medias. Um, but probably the best way, yeah, go to evolvemarriage.com. You can contact me there. Uh, if you go on Facebook and send me a message, my team will make sure it gets to me. I'm all about helping people. So I often get people to reach out to me and, and I really like to serve in the best way I can. Uh, so all our information is at evolvemarriage.com. Love it. And we'll put that in the show notes below so everyone can access that website and uh, reach out to you and connect with you. I'm going to give you the last word, Eric. Any closing comment you might want to share with our Life's Hard Succeed Anyway listeners today? Wow, I, I appreciate it, Alan. Well, be before I even do that, I want to say thank you, right? I honor you. I honor you for creating a space to have these type of conversations. You ask powerful questions. You allow us to share our messages and what you've created with the podcast. I think is a service to a lot of people and you know, the world. So I want to thank you and I want to honor you. Thank you. You know, for me, I'm, I'm all about the power of relationships. I think in our lives, we sacrifice so much at the cost of our relationships. And I often encourage people to refocus, reprioritize the relationship with themselves and the relationship with the people they love, right? We, we're living in a world, plenty of distractions, plenty of ways to isolate ourselves. And now more than ever, we need to relate to others. And so I encourage you, reach out to a friend, send a text, right? Really just connect with somebody you love in order to start building that relationship today. That's a good word, Eric. I sure appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to come on here and share with our listeners a little bit of your experience, your life journey, and some of the wisdom you've learned along the way. It's been awesome. Thanks, Alan. It's been an absolute pleasure, man. If you love this podcast, grab some of Alan's free resources on his website at alanblain.com, spelled A-L-L-A-N-B-L-A-I-N.com. You can also find links to Alan's Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok there in his contact page. Lastly, if you can leave a five-star review for us on your favorite podcast app, that will get these messages out to more people and it will really mean the world to us. Thanks in advance and make it a great day.